In this video, I talk about a wide array of topics that may be hard for some viewers to listen to. So I'm gonna start this off with responding to some comments. I got a bunch of them like this. It's Tabiscus. No, it's Bill Cosby. No, it's Tabuscus. Maybe he's talking about Bill Cosby. No, he's talking about Gian Gomeshi. No, I think he's talking about Martha Stewart. So in my Homer Badman review, who was the celebrity that I was talking about? The answer is no one. I specifically left my wording vague so it applied to any and every celebrity ever accused in a scandal of any kind. However, at the time of recording, though, there were some that were very recent in memory. The most recent ones were Tabuscus being accused of sexual assault and Gian Gameshi being declared not guilty. Although I also had Michael Jackson and O.J. Simpson in mind while making the review because those were the uh, celebrities that the writers had in mind when they made the episode. But seriously, any celebrity that you insert into the review is your own projections. Honestly, everything about how the Tabusca scandal was handled really, really annoyed me. Okay, someone gets accused of little to no evidence years after the fact, and he gets flamed to hell and back. And then the people who say innocent until proven guilty go on to attack April and call her every nasty word in the book. If you're doing that, you're a massive fucking hypocrite. Innocent until proven guilty applies to both the accuser and the accused. In the review, I specifically said that every not guilty verdict is touted as a failure of the legal system. When I had said that, I definitely had Gian Gameshi in mind. Here's a headline, Gian Gameshi not guilty, victim blaming alive. Headline saying that the judge outright said things that he never did, and people demanding a new court system in Canada for dealing with sex crimes. At the time of recording, John Gameshi still has another court case to go to, so he may very well be guilty of the last crime he's accused of, but we'll be talking more about his case a little bit later. Someone commented this on my Tumblr. On the subject of the latest video, I kind of feel like you're seeing a trend in the world that I'm not. What I tend to see is a lot of people doubting victims, especially those who don't fit the nice victim role, and rushing to find some way to disprove any claims that the person that they idolize could ever be anything less than perfection. I know that false claims happen, and that's fucked up, but it might be worth reminding people to also not harass victims those making the claims. Unfortunately, lately, I'm really having a hard time seeing that worldview. In 2014, the biggest magazine publisher in the United States, Rolling Stone, published a story called The Rape on Campus. They did absolutely no verification and published it on confirmation bias. Let me repeat that. A rape story that turned out to be false, with no verification, was published in one of the biggest magazine publishers in the world. It was entirely a fabrication, and it's a fabrication that led to riots and vandalism and destroying the lives of the accused. After the story was revealed as a fabrication, the internet broke out with the hashtag I stand with Jackie, because even after she was proven a liar, people still believed her. If our society wasn't keen to believe people when they said that they were raped, how did this story happen? Why do people, to this day, believe that it actually happened? And this isn't the only situation where this has happened. In 2006, three boys on the Duke lacrosse team were accused on no evidence. They were also accused by someone who is now in jail for first-degree murder. And their trial was prolonged for over a year, and the prosecutor tried to withhold evidence. I think what you might be seeing is an overall response to these stories. Stories that were made high-profile when they really shouldn't have been. Now, I am fairly sure that a woman maliciously accusing a man of rape just out of spite or for attention is very rare. The most common reason that someone receives a false rape allegation is because they are misidentified as the perpetrator. However, stories like that aren't how the news or how people work. Your child is a lot more likely to drown than be kidnapped by a stranger, like thousands of times over more likely. But every single one of you is more afraid of your child being kidnapped than your child drowning. Our mind focuses on the extreme and hits us with our base fears, and the media helps that. And you have to keep this in mind. The very, very few people who are actually making up these false claims, they want as much attention as possible. If there is a solution to this, while it is fine and absolutely acceptable to trust rape victims when they say that they have been raped, we shouldn't publish stories about them in the Rolling Stone, for instance. One of the more cited reasons for rape victims not going to the police is because they don't think that they'll be believed. And when these high-profile cases turn out to be false, it does not help those perceptions, especially with the backlash that's formed of stories like this. Another reason that rape victims say they don't come forward is because they don't have trust in the legal system, which, once again, isn't helped by saying that every not guilty verdict is a failure of the legal system. I've heard it said recently that our courts aren't arbiters of truth, and you're absolutely right. Innocent people get locked up, 
and sometimes guilty people go free. And there are many reasons that a rape victim might not want to come forward to the police. However, while they're not our only arbiters of truth, they are our only arbiters of justice. The only thing that ever has a chance at putting a rapist in jail is going to the police. The actual police, not the college police, and not the lynch mob. However, you're right about one thing, anonymous Tumblr person. We need to stop harassing people for making rape claims. This needs to stop. We don't need vicious denial, just as we don't need vicious support. It will end up discouraging actual rape victims, and it makes you look like a fucking hypocrite. If these people you harass turn out to actually have been raped, you're an asshole. Well, you're an asshole either way, but afterwards, everyone will see that you're an asshole. Both the accused and the accuser are innocent until proven guilty. And yes, you can provide solidarity and caring and compassion for a rape victim without becoming a lynch mob. Kindness and wrath are known as opposites, but it doesn't take much for one to be morphed into the other. This brings me to my next comment. There should be a law of anonymity until the accused is at least charged or until the trial is underway. This would give any man or woman a chance to keep their reputation if they were indeed innocent. Absolutely, I agree with you 100%. There are two options we have as a society for preventing ludicrous claims and mob riots that we've seen in situations like UVA or Duke Lacrosse. Number one, keep the accused anonymous until they are charged. The other one is to start punishing those that falsely accuse. And I will go on record saying that I do not want the law to have to do that. If both parties are kept anonymous until the verdict is released, we can have a no harm, no foul scenario. If we start suing people for false allegations, we may hurt actual victims for accidents. This lynch mob mentality is going to end up hurting actual victims of rape even more than it already is. And a law protecting the identity of the accused seems important. Hell, at this point, it seems constitutionally required for due process. Sexually harassing someone doesn't happen by accident. Alright, I didn't get this comment directly, but people said things with this consensus. And it absolutely could happen by accident. Absent-minded staring, bumping into people by accident, asking someone for coffee on an elevator. Homer could have just asked or said something. Homer is a moron. That's his character. And the only thing on his mind at the time was candy. Most rape cases are not taken to court and similar comments like that. So, I've gotten this one a lot, and they're probably using the statistic from Rain. Like, many of the domestic abuse organizations that I talked about in my Screams of Silence video, they most likely have good intentions, but they're using scare tactics that really hurt the cause. Rain is where the statistic that most rapes are not brought to court and like only three out of every 100 rapists ever receive punishment. Let's see the chart that they use. This chart is completely oblivious to due process. First of all, they state that only 46% of rapes are ever reported to the police. They have a sort but even without reading that, I could tell that if that number is right, it is only by chance. There is no way to get an exact number of crimes that go unreported. They got this number through a survey of women who didn't go to the police afterwards. The problem with this is that one of the reasons that women don't report rape is due to a physiological response, such as orgasm or physical pleasure that puts them in denial that a rape actually occurred. Those women in denial would not answer a survey about something that they denied happened. The number might be lower than 46 or it might be higher. But it's pretty audacious to state something as absolute fact when you only have a 1 in 87 chance of actually getting it right. Out of those 46, only 12 lead to arrest. This is 6 out of 17, or almost one third. In the United States, we have something called probable cause. This means that the police cannot arrest you if they don't have reason to suspect you. If you're not okay with that, I assume you're fine with SWAT teams breaking down people's doors, nearly shooting them and killing their pets because some troll thought that it was funny. That's what a world without probable cause looks like. Out of those 12, nine get prosecuted. Now here is one of the most deceptive statistical tricks in the world, ignoring context. In the United States, 95% of all crimes end in a plea bargain. Only 5% of crimes across the board are prosecuted. According to Rain, depending on which statistic we use, rape is prosecuted anywhere between 9% of the time and 19% of the time, when all crimes across the board only have a rate of 5% prosecution. You'll also notice that I said plea deal. During, say, a gang rape, the police might catch one guy and offer him a lesser sentence if he testifies against his accomplice. He's not prosecuted in that case because he essentially already pled guilty and it speeds up the legal system. So a man is going to jail for 10 years instead of 20 to catch three other rapists, and according to this statistic, statistic that is a rapist never spending a day in jail. These statistics also assume that every rapist only rapes once. Depending on your source, either very few rapists or serial rapists, about half of them are, or most of them are. 
but it's the next statistic that really bugs me. Out of the nine that get prosecuted, only five lead to a felony conviction. This means according to Rain, and everyone who uses this statistic, if you are given a not guilty verdict, you are a rapist who got away with it. From the second you are accused, according to these statistics, you are either a rapist or a rapist that got away with it. Even if you truly believe that, I'd say to stop using the statistic because it is damaging your cause. Number one, using this exact same data, with a little bit of manipulative editing, it states that about 90% of rape accusations do not end in the guilty verdict, and people can take that in all kinds of directions. Number two, do you know one of the biggest reasons that rape victims don't come forward? They don't have trust in the legal system. I've heard both of these things stated sometimes in the same videos that use this bunk statistic, and the cognitive dissonance is amazing. Using the statistic does not help rape victims get the confidence to come forward, and I'm not the only one who thinks this. Also, you have to remember that this was not calculated in comparison to any other crime. Only 5% of murder cases end in conviction, and a murder is a crime where there is almost undisputedly a wide array of evidence, while rape is far too often a he said, she said kind of deal. We can make statistics say whatever the hell we want them to. People are already attacking defense attorneys. They've done it in the Gian Gameshi case. I did not know that. I did not actually know that in the production of the last video. What these people seem to want is the removal of due process. Gian Gameshi shouldn't have been allowed to have an attorney at all. If you want to know what kind of system that these people want, there are two places you can go. Number one, you can go to Japan. They have a 99% conviction rate. A defense attorney there is pretty much a joke, and might only win four cases in his entire career, if he's lucky. The judges even refer to defendants as those bastards. Also, it's really easy to promote, hire, or fire judges, meaning that people who hold certain ideologies, like liberalism, can be demoted. The other place you can go if you want removal of due process is a college campus. So I hear that college has a major problem with sexual assault right now. The stats say that one in five women will be sexually assaulted during a four-year stay at a university. Let's really look at the statistic. A woman is more likely to be sexually assaulted in a college or university than a man who goes to prison, according to the statistic. A man going to prison has a one in 14 chance of being sexually assaulted or raped. If this statistic is true, then I would probably try to convince my daughter to choose a different career path. If the stat isn't true, then I'm probably going to convince my son to choose a different career path. What is going on is something called problem, reaction, solution. It's a business model that many governments run. It works like this. Airplane hijacking is a rare event, and the politician knows this. However, one high-profile event happens, and the media sensationalizes it, even though what happens is rare. The politician then passes the TSA. When a plane you get on isn't hijacked after going through the TSA, you can connect the dots, even though the TSA has never actually stopped a terrorist. Let me guess what your college or university is telling you. One in five women are being raped on campus, but we've got all of these wonderful programs to stop this from happening, like a class that tells people not to rape, even though most people, by the time they reach adulthood, know what boundaries are. These programs are about as useful as abstinence-only education. Most people who commit any crime are not ignorant of the law. They commit the crime in spite of their knowledge. And even if they were ignorant of the law, they could still be prosecuted and they could still be arrested. Security theater, at the best of times, is an inconvenience. At the worst, well, let's remove all due process on campus. Colleges tend to run their own private investigations. Upon a mere accusation, the men will be expelled. You'll notice that in that statement I use gendered language. This is because if a man accuses a woman of raping him, he will also be expelled. There are numerous stories where this has happened. Not only that, as we've seen with Duke Lacrosse and UVA, any home they reside in will be vandalized and their lives will be put into immediate danger. There's another college Story that I haven't brought up. Mattress Girl. A woman named Emma Sokowitz carried a mattress around her campus, alleging that she was raped. She said that she stopped doing it when the suspect she accused was expelled. The person accused was shunned and bullied and subjected to threats, under no proof whatsoever. So what is the aftermath? This false rape allegation that has seriously harmed someone's social life with no proof has been touted as one of the best performance art pieces of the year. I guess we do take false rape allegations seriously. By the way, the Duke Lacrosse and the Rolling Stones writer, neither of them faced punishment for what they did. Raising a false rape story to national consciousness, and as a result, making people who claim that they have been raped seem less credible as a result. In fact, according to these stories, if a woman claims that she was raped, even after she has been proven false and lying, people will still see her in the light of being a rape victim. It's like if I said that I was a war veteran and I was proven wrong, but anyone who criticized me would be called unpatriotic or terrorist. Calling known liars rape victims is the most disrespectful thing you can do to actual legitimate rape victims. As for college, I'm honestly surprised that these statistics are not hurting their business. 
Well, I mean, men are starting to sue many schools for Title IX violations, which once again can lead to the exact scenario that these lack of due process establishments try to prevent. But enrollment keeps going up. Honestly, I'd personally consider myself a bad parent if I sent my daughter to a place where she has a 20% chance of being raped, or my son to a place where he has absolutely no due process. A place where my daughter has a significant chance to be violated and go through a kind of trauma that I couldn't imagine. Or a place where my son could have his entire future stolen from him before it even begins. Speaking of due process, New York and California have passed affirmative consent laws. This means that consent must be continually ongoing throughout the whole event, and saying no or lack of protest does not mean that there was consent. This sounds good in theory, but this is going to backfire in a major way. If someone is recording a sexual encounter because they don't want to be falsely accused, recording, even getting a contract, that means you were there. The film clearly shows that you failed to read her mind. You see that? It was less than a second, but it was a micro-expression of fear. You're a rapist. If you are getting into a sexual activity, you need to be aware that it might get uncomfortable, and your partner is not a mind reader. If you don't think you're ready, you don't have to do this now. But remember that you have the power to say no for any reason you want to, the second that things become uncomfortable. And man or woman, if your partner does not listen to you, they are a rapist. However, no one can say no on your behalf except for you. Your partner can say no on his or her own behalf, but they cannot say no for you. The law cannot say no for you. The law may put this person in jail afterwards, but it cannot stop the event as it is happening especially if the law encourages you to not firmly tell your partner to stop in the moment, as these yes means yes laws do. Outside of prison, a man has a bigger chance of being raped himself than getting a false rape allegation. Statistically, men also have a higher chance of being in a car crash than being in a plane crash. However, both of them tend to end up in a pretty terrible place, and they have to worry about both. People are not numbers. I mean, I'm more likely to get burglarized than I am to get murdered, but I'm definitely afraid of getting murdered more than getting burglarized. Some men have even been audacious enough to say that they'd rather be raped than falsely accused of rape. I know to most that probably sounds crazy, but it's not. I feel like I'm taking a significant risk by saying this, but for me, personally, the line is if a child is conceived and my rapist would carry it to term, and I will give you the best explanation I can give. If I were to be raped, immediately I'd be branded as a joke. If people believe me at all, they would laugh at me. People would use this video as a statement to minimize my suffering and pretty much anything else. My chances of getting any justice at all are zero. There are a lot of reasons for that. But remember, this is if my rapist would either be male or female. And this is all assuming it happens to me outside of prison. I'd get all of the typical feelings of trauma and violation. The feelings of loss of control. Keep in mind, this is an asexual who abhors the thought of engaging in any kind of sexual activity. Afterwards, I need to get myself checked for STDs and HIV, which is a problem in and of itself, while I would be trying my hardest to get the police to take this issue seriously. The people who claim to be rape victim advocates, they would probably be using me as a political pigeon. See? Men get raped too. We need to keep up this fear-mongering that's stopping rape victims from coming forward. Meanwhile, if I was raped by a woman, for the next nine months, possibly longer, I'd be terrified and wondering of how drastically my life would be changing. She'd be able to use this possible child to extort me into all kinds of scenarios. Remember, I probably wouldn't know if she was or wasn't pregnant until the second term, at least three months, and if she put on weight, she could probably keep the lie going on a little bit longer. I'd be saving up for a lawyer to try to get sole custody, while wondering how the hell I'm going to tell a judge that I'm a more responsible parent than a rapist, while at the same time explaining that my job is yelling at Spongebob for a living. This is why the line for me is drawn at childbirth. After that, either I'd have to pay a rapist for 18 years for what she did to me, or I'd have to pay thousands of dollars to keep my child away from a terrible person, and proving that I could be not just a competent parent, but the best parent in the world to get sole custody, when I'm not even in my 30s yet, and I have no idea what to do with my life. My life has barely begun. On the other hand, if I was falsely accused of rape, this channel is probably over, let's start with that. I'd post videos for a while and try to get some money to defend myself, but they'd be disliked to hell and I'd lose subscribers every single day. And of course, I wouldn't be able to get any other job at this time, and this time could be upwards of three years. Imagine that. Three years of unable to get a job. Actually, it could be as long as my false accuser wanted. If they never took it to court, there's no statement of my possible innocence. Everything that I've ever said becomes means to incriminate me further. Of course he keeps saying that he's a sexual. He's just using that so we'd believe he'd never do something like this. Of course he's trying to stop the myth that all men are perverts. Of course he's making the video that you're watching right now. Yeah. All of that. It'd probably be declared null and void. Anything that I say in the future will be filtered through the lens of this guy is a sex offender. I have a significant risk of even my closest friends and family members abandoning me. I could lose my home, or my home could be vandalized, as I most certainly would be doxxed. And this event would be an ongoing continual one. I don't even have to know this person that's doing it to me, by the way. Other people might see an opportunity and jump on the bandwagon and start accusing me. What this does is make their case look stronger while making me look guilty. I.e., they have absolutely nothing to lose. And if it never gets brought to court, 
sports, people will assume this about me forever. At some point, I'd probably contemplate suicide. And if I told anyone about it, they'd genuinely be encouraging me to do it. It wouldn't be like the idiot trolls to do it now. There would be actual intent of wanting me to do it. If this does get reported to the police, and they wanted to go that far, well, for starters, I don't have enough money to pay bail on something like that. So, I'd probably disappear for a while. You know, it might be years as the justice system is backed up like these people keep telling me. In the meantime, while I'm waiting in jail, I'll be firmly and vigilantly aware that the only thing that gets people shanked or raped in jail more than being a rapist is being a child molester. So I might get either of those things happening to me repeatedly before I'm even put on trial. There's also the other option of the justice system offering me a plea deal and trying to scare me into taking one by declaring myself guilty for a lower sentence. Such things might include me being on the sex offender registry for a length of time. When I get on the trial, there are a number of things that I have to worry about. Like the ideal perpetrator, ideal victim thing. Like how even my own appearance can be used against me. How I kind of look like a creeper with the whole unshaven hobo look. How mental illness is being linked to crimes like shootings might be brought up to indict me. How each and every one of my flaws would be put under the microscope. My lawyer would probably be pro bono, which means that he's going to sit there silently while everyone says whatever they want to, and I'm essentially defending myself. But that's okay, because that's what the internet hate mob seems to want. If I get out of it with a not guilty verdict, the internet explodes on how justice wasn't done, how a monster got away with it. And I'd have the option to go after the liar, who has an immense amount of public support, when I look like a fucking monster already. What it comes down to, provided that I am the only victim and a child is not conceived, I'd rather spend the rest of my life being a joke than being a monster. Only 2 to 8% of rape allegations are false. Interesting, because I hear that only 3% of rape allegations turn out to be true. Both of these numbers are bunk. The study that cites that examines about 130 cases over the span of 10 years. It has an extremely small sample size, too small to be credible. But let's assume that you're right about everything, about all of the numbers. For reference, there were 79,000 rape victims in 2012. There were also 79,000 convicted sex offenders in that year. 2% of 79,000 is 1,580. 8% is 6,320. That is between 4 and 17 people being falsely accused per day. And this is if we're only using convictions, and not things all the way up to the crimes that weren't reported. There are many different answers to the amount of false allegations, and studies put them all over the board. No one has any idea. So, how many people are raped or falsely accused of rape in the United States? Until we have microchips in the back of our necks tracking everything we're doing, we are not going to know, and we need to move forward confidently with certainty that we're never going to know. I can throw all kinds of numbers at you. The Innocence Project has freed 268 people who were falsely accused. Out of them, 153 were falsely accused of rape. And I need to say this, people who are using this number to say that false rape allegations are the majority, they need to stop as well. There are literally millions of prisoners right now. This also suffers from a very small small sample size. Let me put it this way. To the people who say that the numbers of false accusations are too low to care about, would you, in the same breath, tell me that we should stop caring about rape victims when we get their numbers low? To say, between 4 and 17 rapes per day. Numbers do not matter. People are not numbers. And stop treating them like they are. It's a disgrace to victims, and it's a disgrace to what you claim to do. One person who gets raped is too many. One person who gets falsely accused of rape and gets his or her life destroyed is too many. Because this isn't going to be a men's only problem forever. People are becoming more and more aware that men can be raped by women. And both men and women are fully capable of lying. I don't doubt that when our society as a whole believes that men can be raped by women, there will be men who also falsely accuse. And neither a man or a woman, people who outright maliciously lie about rape are terrible people. Always. So, what can we do? Here's a quote. Any justice system can put a person in jail, but our justice system is specifically designed to put the right person in jail. When we don't have due process, we put our best guess in jail, and sometimes we're wrong. And here's the thing. If a woman was really raped, but she points to the wrong person for whatever reason, or the police get the wrong guy, and we decide that he's guilty immediately, not only do we essentially destroy an innocent man's life, but the rape victim does not get justice. The only person who actually wins in that scenario is the rapist. If he never rapes again, then he gets away with it. If he does rape again, well, now we've got three victims instead of one. It is very brave for a rape victim to come to the police, and that bravery deserves to have justice, and due process is a part of justice. Attacking a person because they were merely accused is not just. Also, raising unverified stories to mainstream attention makes it harder for society as a whole to take rape victims seriously, and sticking by people after they've been proven to be liars makes us all seem delusional. What would I do? First of all, I'd make it so the accused is anonymous, at least until they're charged, if not tried. That would cut back 
and malicious claims almost immediately, and that would most likely leave us with only our misidentifications. At this point, I could argue that the media circuses that come out of this violate a person's Sixth Amendment right to an impartial jury, as many jurors would love to claim the fame of being the guy who indicted the pariah or made the guilty guy go free. And it's much better than the alternative of punishing people when accidents are far more common than malintent. Secondly, we need to encourage more rape victims to come to the police. In the past couple of weeks, especially with these recent scandals, I've heard many rape survivor advocates say that the courts don't work, or that people have a hard time being believed. Like saying the Gian Gomeshi case was how our justice system tends to treat victims, or citing any of the statistics revealed here today. This all makes it harder for rape victims to come forward with their stories. People are not numbers. And the statistics, there's no way they can guess your story. No matter what you're going through, the numbers are not your story. If you are a rape victim, you are more than a statistic. Remember that though it might be difficult, going to the police is the only way to put your rapist in prison. That is the only way they can be brought to justice. If someone is accused, we shouldn't storm them or indict them immediately. Keep an open mind and get all the evidence first. If possible, let the courts deal with it before you do. Remember that just because someone is an asshole doesn't necessarily mean that they're a criminal. At the same time, we should also apply that same standard to the accuser. We should not immediately decide that they're liars. That being said, we should not signal boost these stories up to media circus levels, because when they turn out to be false, they tend to do unfathomable damage to our perception of rape victims. In this video, I talk about a wide array of topics that may be hard for some viewers to listen to. So I'm going to start this off with responding to some comments. I got a bunch of them like this. It's Tabiscus. No, it's Bill Cosby. No, it's Tabuscus. Maybe he's talking about Bill Cosby. No, he's talking about Gian Gomeshi. No, I think he's talking about Martha Stewart. So in my Homer Badman review, who was the celebrity that I was talking about? The answer is no one. I specifically left my wording vague so it applied to any and every celebrity ever accused in a scandal of any kind. However, at the time of recording though, there were some that were very recent in memory. The most recent ones were Tabuscus being accused of sexual assault and Gian Gomeshi being declared not guilty. Although I also had Michael Jackson and O.J. Simpson in mind while making the review because those were the uh, celebrities that the writers had in mind when they made the episode. But seriously, any celebrity that you insert into the review is your own projections. Honestly, everything about how the Tabusca scandal was handled really, really annoyed me. Okay, someone gets accused of little to no evidence years after the fact, and he gets flamed to hell and back. And then the people who say innocent until proven guilty go on to attack April and call her every nasty word in the book. If you're doing that, you're a massive fucking hypocrite. Innocent until proven guilty applies to both the accuser and the accused. In the review, I specifically said that every not guilty verdict is touted as a failure of the legal system. When I had said that, I definitely had Gian Gomeshi in mind. Here's a headline, Gian Gomeshi not guilty, victim blaming alive. Headline saying that the judge outright said things that he never did. And people demanding a new court system in Canada for dealing with sex crimes. At the time of recording, John Gomeshi still has another court case to go to, so he may very well be guilty of the last crime he's accused of, but we'll be talking more about his case a little bit later. Someone commented this on my Tumblr. On the subject of the latest video, I kind of feel like you're seeing a trend in the world that I'm not. What I tend to see is a lot of people doubting victims, especially those who don't fit the nice victim role, and rushing to find some way to disprove any claims that the person that they idolize could ever be anything less than perfection. I know that false claims happen, and that's fucked up, but it might be worth reminding people to also not harass victims those making the claims. Unfortunately, lately, I'm really having a hard time seeing that worldview. In 2014, the biggest magazine publisher in the United States, Rolling Stone, published a story called The Rape on Campus. They did absolutely no verification and published it on confirmation bias. Let me repeat that. A rape story that turned out to be false, with no verification, was published in one of the biggest magazine publishers in the world. It was entirely a fabrication, and it's a fabrication that led to riots and vandalism and destroying the lives of the accused. After the story was revealed as a fabrication, the internet broke out with the hashtag I stand with Jackie, because even after she was proven a liar, people still believed her. If our society wasn't keen to believe people when they said that they were raped, how did this story happen? Why do people, to this day, believe that it actually happened? And this isn't the only situation where this has happened. In 2006, three boys on the Duke lacrosse team were accused on no evidence. They were also accused by someone who is now in jail for first-degree murder. And their trial was prolonged for over a year. And the prosecutor tried to withhold evidence. I think what you might be seeing is an overall response to these stories. Stories that were made high-profile when they really shouldn't have been. Now, I am fairly sure that a woman maliciously accusing a man of rape just 
just out of spite or for attention is very rare. The most common reason that someone receives a false rape allegation is because they are misidentified as the perpetrator. However, stories like that aren't how the news or how people work. Your child is a lot more likely to drown than be kidnapped by a stranger, like thousands of times over more likely. But every single one of you is more afraid of your child being kidnapped than your child drowning. Our mind focuses on the extreme and hits us with our base fears, and the media helps that. And you have to keep this in mind. The very, very few people who are actually making up these false claims, they want as much attention as possible. If there is a solution to this, while it is fine and absolutely acceptable to trust rape victims when they say that they have been raped, we shouldn't publish stories about them in the Rolling Stone, for instance. One of the more cited reasons for rape victims not going to the police is because they don't think that they'll be believed. And when these high-profile cases turn out to be false, it does not help those perceptions, especially with the backlash that's formed of stories like this. Another reason that rape victims say they don't come forward is because they don't have trust in the legal system, which, once again, isn't helped by saying that every not guilty verdict is a failure of the legal system. I've heard it said recently that our courts aren't arbiters of truth, and you're absolutely right. Innocent people get locked up, and sometimes guilty people go free. And there are many reasons that a rape victim might not want to come forward to the police. However, while they're not our only arbiters of truth, they are our only arbiters of justice. The only thing that ever has a chance at putting a rapist in jail is going to the police. The actual police, not the college police, and not the lynch mob. However, you're right about one thing, anonymous Tumblr person. We need to stop harassing people for making rape claims. This needs to stop. We don't need vicious denial, just as we don't need vicious support. It will end up discouraging actual rape victims, and it makes you look like a fucking hypocrite. If these people you harass turn out to actually have been raped, you're an asshole. Well, you're an asshole either way, but afterwards, everyone will see that you're an asshole. Both the accused and the accuser are innocent until proven guilty. And yes, you can provide solidarity and caring and compassion for a rape victim without becoming a lynch mob. Kindness and wrath are known as opposites, but it doesn't take much for one to be morphed into the other. This brings me to my next comment. There should be a law of anonymity until the accused is at least charged or until the trial is underway. This would give any man or woman a chance to keep their reputation if they were indeed innocent. Absolutely, I agree with you 100%. There are two options we have as a society for preventing ludicrous claims and mob riots that we've seen in situations like UVA or Duke Lacrosse. Number one, keep the accused anonymous until they are charged. The other one is to start punishing those that falsely accuse. And I will go on record saying that I do not want the law to have to do that. If both parties are kept anonymous until the verdict is released, we can have a no harm, no foul scenario. If we start suing people for false allegations, we may hurt actual victims for accidents. This lynch mob mentality is going to end up hurting actual victims of rape even more than it already is. And a law protecting the identity of the accused seems important. Hell, at this point, it seems constitutionally required for due process. Sexually harassing someone doesn't happen by accident. Alright, I didn't get this comment directly, but people said things with this consensus. And it absolutely could happen by accident. Absent-minded staring, bumping into people by accident, asking someone for coffee on an elevator. Homer could have just asked or said something. Homer is a moron. That's his character. And the only thing on his mind at the time was candy. Most rape cases are not taken to court and similar comments like that. So, I've gotten this one a lot, and they're probably using the statistic from Rain. Like, many of the domestic abuse organizations that I talked about in my Screams of Silence video, they most likely have good intentions, but they're using scare tactics that really hurt the cause. Rain is where the statistic that most rapes are not brought to court, and like, only three out of every 100 rapists ever receive punishment. Let's see the chart that they use. This chart is completely oblivious to due process. First of all, they state that only 46% of rapes are ever reported to the police. They have a sort but even without reading that, I can tell that if that number is right, it is only by chance. There is no way to get an exact number of crimes that go unreported. They got this number through a survey of women who didn't go to the police afterwards. The problem with this is that one of the reasons 